Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you guys with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Okay, happy Tuesday, everybody. Thank you for your patience and understanding with yesterday's video.、Uh, I have、uh, taken the flight and I have now arrived back, and so the audio should be better today and going forward. Over the last few videos, we have discussed the unfolding Chinese balloon story. So for today's episode, we will discuss other important stories and likely return to the balloon fallout from tomorrow. First up for today's video, though, we need to cover several salient developments related to the property crisis. And we are seeing yet more supportive measures being rolled out. A number of major Chinese cities have temporarily cut mortgage rates for first-time home buyers in order to boost domestic side support in the crisis-hit sector. We remember last month the central bank said cities are eligible to remove minimum interest rates on loans for first-home purchases if prices drop month on month and year on year for three consecutive months. In a report published today, China Index Academy analysts wrote, quote, "In the short term, policies for both supply and demand are expected to continue to take effect, especially in major first and second tier cities. More demand side policies may be in the pipeline to entice on the fence home buyers to enter the market. As such, first and second tier cities could be first to welcome a recovery in their property market." End quote. This optimistic forecast may be premature, however. According to calculations made by Chinese financial media outlet Taishin yesterday, at least eight second-tier cities lowered mortgage rates for first-time home buyers to between 3.7 and 3.9 percent after the recent holiday period, that is Lunar New Year, below the national floor of 4.1 percent. Chinese regulators, with memories of the housing crisis and global financial crisis in North America, have long been hesitant in allowing households to become too overleveraged, but with the Property crisis entering its third year, and with the issues now primarily falling on the demand side, regulators are becoming more desperate. One of the cities involved in the lower mortgage rate program is Zhengzhou, provincial capital of Henan. We remember that this relatively poor city of 10 million people was the epicenter of last year's mortgage boycott movement. Chinese financial media outlet Yitai writes that the city saw a painful 40% decline in home sales by floor space in 2022, making them eligible for these temporary mortgage rate cuts. According to a local government statement yesterday, the northeastern provincial capital of Harbin is offering residents without local registration, buying their first or second homes, a one-time cash reward of 10,000 RMB, 1,500 US dollars. Rural households will be given 30,000 RMB. Some major cities are going even further. Wuhan, provincial capital of Hubei, population 13 million, will allow local families to buy an additional home in areas with purchasing caps, in an important easing measure likely to be followed in other localities. Restrictions on buying additional housing units exist in most major cities and are designed to reduce speculation. As such, this move from Wuhan is quite a big deal. Quote. Restrictions centering around how many apartments a family can buy used to be the least flexible policy lever in China. The easing by the Wuhan government has strong implications, showing that even such hard rules could be made more flexible. End quote. While commentators agree that demand needs to be lifted, they are divided on how effective these easing measures will be in practice in raising demand. Quote, Wuhan is pulling back slightly on housing purchase restrictions in another policy attempt to stimulate demand. In previous real estate cycles, the relaxation of purchase restrictions and cuts in mortgage rates would stimulate housing sales. But I am not sure the old rules of these cycles apply now. End quote. Now, while we are on the housing sector, one last thing: Bloomberg writes today that among 60 mainland-listed property firms that made profit alerts by the 31st of January deadline, 60% expected losses for last year. Quote: When a credit crunch sent shockwaves through the industry and triggered defaults, Bloomberg calculations based on public data show only 5% of firms turned to profitable, while another 5% saw net income growing from a year earlier. The rest said profits fell. End quote.
Next up, trade talks and corruption. Hey guys, if you enjoyed the episode, don't forget to hit that like button. You'll notice that the channel is about 200 subscribers away from hitting that 40,000 subscriber mark. It would be amazing if we could hit that this week. If you're one of the 50% of viewers who are currently not subscribed, maybe consider subscribing and you'll be on top of this analysis when it's released every day. And of course, it's a big help for the channel. And anyone who wants to go that extra mile and help me keep the channel sustainable, Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee links are in the description below. The channel primarily relies on subscriber support to stay sustainable. As always, thank you so much everybody for the ongoing support. Okay, let's continue. As we explored last week, there appears to be a thawing of relations between Canberra and Beijing, with trade being the mutually beneficial mechanism for the reset. The Australian Trade Minister, Don Farrell, has held a video talk with the PRC Minister of Commerce, the first of its kind since 2019, with the result being that the former will travel to Beijing for more trade talks in the near future. After the talk, Farrell expressed to media yesterday, quote, Our meeting represents another important step in the stabilization of Australia's relations with China. End quote. The sentiment was echoed by PRC Commerce Minister Wang Wentao, who expressed, according to state-run Xinhua, quote, China is ready to restart the economic and trade exchanges mechanisms with Australia, end quote. Adding, perhaps in a cautioning tone, quote, China is closely following Australia's tightened security review of Chinese companies' investment and operations in Australia and hopes that Australia can appropriately handle relevant cases and provide a fair, open and equal business environment for Chinese companies. End quote. And finally for today's episode, the Central Commission on Discipline and Inspection is investigating 10 senior agricultural officials on allegations of corruption and other discipline violations related to the purchase and sale of grain. This appears to be part of a large campaign ramping up to reduce corruption related to national food supply. Indeed, the state-run Global Times writes yesterday that, quote, the government is deepening its crackdown on agencies charged with ensuring food security, end quote. Yesterday, Monday, the Central Commission on Discipline and Inspection, CCDI, vowed to, quote, thoroughly punish systemic corruption and ensure national food security, end quote. On China Update, we have observed that national food security has become a priority for Beijing leadership in recent years, and this campaign to root out incompetence and corruption in grain procurement, sale and storage is quite telling. Last week, the CCDI issued rules intended to address the, quote, lack of effective supervision and law enforcement for officials, organizations and companies in charge of buying, selling and storing grain. End quote. It calls for strong punishments as a deterrent to the, quote, corruption problems behind chaos in the grain market, end quote. In a separate report published by the CCDI last week, the Graft Watchdog described the grain marketing system as being, quote, riddled with systemic corruption that includes skimming of funds, circular purchases of grain already in warehouses, fake transactions, and warehouses stocked with adulterated grain, end quote. It even goes as far as expressing that not only has corruption in the sector not bottomed out, but may actually be getting worse. An excellent blog called Dim Sums, which primarily discusses food and agricultural economy policy and development in China, published a piece this week examining this corruption scandal issue in food security. The Dim Sums piece writes that the grain corruption problems reveal a mistaken presumption that officials operating state-owned companies and government bureaus will act in the public interest. Quote, this fallacy is crystallized by the anti-corruption essays call for rooting out shadow shareholders, shadow companies, and state skin private bones, end quote. Adding, quote, these cryptic terms refer to a case brought to light by inspectors in Heilongjiang province last year in which five state-owned companies secretly held controlling shares in as many as 31 private companies, 
The subsidiary companies were allowed to illegally procure and store grain for government reserves and collect 100 million yuan in subsidies to store the grain in exchange for 10 million yuan in bribes. Xi Jinping thought he could inculcate moral values in his atheist officials by forcing them to study his important speeches. Now the party is having to install a parallel system of inspectors to monitor and punish officials who violate the rules. But what motivates the inspectors? The CCDI essay complains that people already tasked with oversight often just go through the motions and turn a blind eye to violations. Perhaps yet another layer of inspectors will be needed to inspect the inspectors. Officials probably should shift some of their study sessions from Marx to Machiavelli. End quote. Okay, that is today's episode of China Update. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. Have a wonderful day wherever you are, and I will see you all tomorrow.